Hi, everybody. Welcome to Happy Hour Live on Brew Sports. We welcome you inside the studio for a Thursday edition of the program. We've got a great one in store for you today. A lot of great action to get to. Some crazy new headlines that are just burning in the back of our minds that we just have to tell you about because... That's how the sports world works. You never know what exactly is going to pop up at any given time, and we're going to get to all the latest headlines here in just a moment. But before we do that, I need to tell you about the in- incredibly awesome people sitting next to me. Uh, making a return to the panel is Megan Landvatter. Good to see you, Megan. And, of course, James Stewart. Uh, good afternoon to both of you. Uh, how's life today on this Thursday, a day away from the weekend? Life must be good for both of you, I feel like. I mean, Megan, yeah, welcome back. Good. How's good? Thank How are you, you. doing? Yeah, I'm I'm, good. I can't wait for the weekend. I'm ready for it right so now. So you got something <laughs> fun you're taking place on here, James. Like, it's almost not even fair. Yeah, the weekend starts for me tomorrow, so I'll, I'll be excited. I'm on oh my way to gosh. Greece. Whoa, on the yeah. way to Greece. How long are you going for? Uh, I think it's 10 days, I think. Wow. Must I be nice. I'm not planning anything. I'm just going to get just on gonna the go. plane and figure just gonna it out. Just going to go and see what happens, honestly. <laughs> That's not a bad process to go about, honestly, though, when you're thinking about going. Just, you know, plan it out. Right. Are you guys staying in Athens, or where are you guys planning on staying? Athens and then Santorini. Wow. So it'll be, it'll be a good trip. Well, say hi to the Parthenon and all those other great places yeah. for us while you're gone. Maybe there, I'll basically. see where uh, Giannis grew up. Maybe you could go and find uh, go find Pythagoras too while you're over there, yes. the next great <laughs> NBA star for the Knicks. I still can't believe I fell. For oh that. my gosh, I couldn't <laughs> believe that. We read him a story. Or we read a story on halftime about from the kicker about Pythagoras helping the Knicks run the triangle, and he was actually looking. He's <laughs> messaging us, be like, guys, like I can't find this Pythagoras guy. <laughs> I'm frantically we're at like, my computer punching uh, keys, like, like come on, man, not know this? <laughs> come on. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to talk to uh, a man that knows the triangle better than most people, uh, Mitch Vomhoff, in our second segment to help us talk about the NBA playoffs and some of the other great action that's coming up here at the end of the season. But before we get to all of that, it's time to get to the latest and greatest headlines here in the wide world of sports. Right off the bat, the big one here from the Masters is that Dustin Johnson uh, went out to the first tee today, took a couple of practice swings, and ultimately pulled out of the Masters. This is only the fifth time the number one player in the world officially backed out, and many people had a lot of money riding on Dustin Johnson, and now all of a sudden he has pulled out kind of has wa- opened the field a little bit higher now. But um, do you agree with his decision to, to back out and not go, uh, despite, you know, trying it out? I mean, right. I get, he fell down the stairs, for those that don't know, yesterday and injured his back and his elbows, two very important things, of course, to use when you play golf. But do you, do you think this was a smart decision from him to, to take the rest of, I mean, of all tournaments, the Masters? The th- the, like you said, he fell down the stairs, accident. That's the unfortunate thing. It's something that, you know, you can't plan for. It's, it's not – your typical injury, you didn't get hurt playing or, or anything right. like that. But it's the back, you know, the elbows, it's all that. And you got to think of Tiger Woods. Yeah. The back. I mean, that pretty much. I mean, how many times have we seen Tiger Woods drop out of tournament? I mean, Tiger Woods dropped out of this tournament right. because he was having back issues. So and it is the Masters. very common. But, I mean, it, a back issue is, is not something to play with in golf. It's Yeah. No, I'd have to agree. Um I mean, the one thing that you can say about this is it's unfortunate, but kind of like James was saying, at least he didn't do something stupid. It's not like, you know, I don't know, Plexical Burris at the club, (laughs) you know, getting, you know, something like that, you know. Shooting himself in the leg, not exactly something to uh, be proud of. Right. At least this is, you know, an injury that was completely by accident. Obviously, you know, he, I'm sure, is not happy about missing the Masters. Obviously, there are a lot of fans who were excited for him and want him to be there. But again, um, yeah, when you're talking about a back injury, in terms of his career, um, if he wants to continue to play golf, I think it's very smart of him to kind of sit this one right. out, really take the time that he needs to, you know, fix the injury, and then hopefully he can get back to form um, as quickly as possible. Well, that's the, oh, sorry, go ahead. This tournament has such, you know, prestige that it's not, it's not going to, it's not going to lose fans because of it. No, and I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. And for he's him. not going to lose followers either. Right. People are going to be like, well, screw you, Dustin Johnson. I mean, of course, I was you want to see the So excited one in the to world. see you. But, I mean, it's still the Masters. It's still, it's still Augusta. You're still going to – there's still a lot of guys, a lot of top guys there. Right, All exactly. The top guys there. And, and one of the big things, too, that's been taking place already at the Masters, and you see it here in the bottom ticker as well, is that uh, Jordan Spieth got uh, – quadruple bogeyed again unfortunately just kind of falling apart here as the the season continues to go on on the on hole 15 shooting four over par just ah that just got it that (laughs) i mean i'm not that great of a golfer but i'd like to think that even i would be able to do a little better than that (laughs) maybe not maybe not (laughs) but uh i could be totally wrong about that no offense to you jordan but the 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 mental block continues to to hit Jordan right. Spieth, and that was the big question coming into this tournament too: was will he be able to get over his massive collapse last year? Because it looked like he was going to just run away with the Masters last year. Then he just dive bombed towards the end. Right. But I mean, when people joke about saying golf is a mental sport, golf is a mental sport. 
this is case in point number one, I feel right. like. Yeah. Um, yeah, with golf, the, the hard part about it is is that golf is a completely individualized sport. It's how you play. It's how you take the course. It's what mental state you're in. It's all you. It's not like you're on, you know, the basketball court and you have four other guys to kind of bail you out of that mental, you know, issue. Um, it's all you. And until you can really overcome that mental challenge and kind of get yourself back and get your confidence back, it's going to be kind of a tough ride. So definitely tough for Spieth right now. You, you also have to wonder, you know, with all this, you know, with the absence of Tiger, We've been talking about this for almost way too long now. Who's going to fill that, that Tiger Woods void right. and bring in the casual fan? And Spieth was really on a roll. And you wonder, does, does all that kind of get into their heads? As much as we talk about it, do they talk about who's going to fill this void? That's the big thing. I don't know. I mean, do these guys, are these golfers sitting at home, you know, going right. like, ah, now Tiger's not here. It's like, maybe I can be the next Tiger. Fred, like, mm, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> calm down, Rory. I don't think that's going to be the, the reason that's actually going to happen. But I've got the leaderboard pulled up in front of me right now, looking at some of the, uh, the top right now. Uh, a gentleman by the name of William uh, McGirt leads all golfers. Technically, he's tied in first place with Charlie Hoffman. I've never heard of either of these two gentlemen, but uh, they're both three under par right now, leading the pack. Uh, some of the more notable names, you got Phil Mickelson tied at fourth with a bunch of people. He is one under par right now, uh, shot a 71 uh, for the day. But uh, some of the other big names, Ricky Fowler, he is at one over right now. Uh, still scrolling down, uh, Jason Day, uh, two over right now. So definitely some people being sucked in. Uh, Rory McIlroy tied for 42nd, right. three over. So the first round of the Masters has been less than favorable to some of these gentlemen. And I get it, it's day one, right. but still a lot taking place right and, off the bat. Doesn't that kind of prove that point of, you know, that I would consider myself a casual fan of golf. And sure. Like you said, you read the top guys, and I've never heard of either one of them. But, again, I'm a casual fan. So when you say Ricky Fowler or Rory McIlroy. Bubba Watson, or, names but, like yeah, that. Guys like that, they're, and, and they're lower on the, on the <laughs> rankings. It's harder for me to be to know what's going on, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. That that is the big thing, honestly. When a lot of this stuff comes down, it's like, okay, well, you know, every year though, doesn't it feel like there's that one guy that right. flies out of nowhere, and then it's like, ah, oh, here's your Cinderella. It's like it's so much harder to predict a Cinderella golfer than yeah. it is like a you know the, to predict the final four. I feel like in a tournament. Well, oh, final absolutely. four didn't work for me either. So. True <laughs> enough. True <laughs> enough. But do you think that is you know a negative for golf, or do you think that kind of brings more of the excitement of you literally never know who's going to win a tournament or does that kind of turn you off because you're like I don't know these guys I mean I don't know for I think me, the unpredictability I think is what people love right yeah for sure I think for me though I, I would love to have that I think when Tiger was there I was paying attention a lot a lot more than I am at this point unfortunately but I would love to see you know the number one guy Dustin or uh, Johnson finish this thing and that's mm -hmm. that was kind of like Going in, you heard the injury, so now we've got an instant storyline, mm -hmm. and you're paying attention, and then to see him not be in it, it's, it's kind of, for me. Right. That, that was the big thing, too. For me, even as a casual golfer, I was like, listen, I mean, Dustin Johnson, I feel like it's still a good experience to go out and play. Like, you kind of tell people, be like, look, guys, don't expect a lot. I'm going to just go out and see what my body lets me do. I'm going to give it a go. Maybe I'll... Maybe I won't make the cut, but I'm going to at least go and try. Right. I don't think anybody would have faulted him for no. going out and trying to play at least a little bit. A couple of comments on Facebook. Aaron thinks that Dustin Johnson needs to stop drinking before the night that he plays since he <laughs> fell down the stairs. It was only three steps, but, I mean, I've fallen down just one step sometimes walking <laughs> in my house, and I'm just, like, super sore the next day. So three steps you know, on wooden stairs, supposedly, is the analysis that ESPN broke, is that it was their wooden <laughs> stairs that he fell down. Was of course, it a hardwood? Was it like bamboo? That's what I don't know. Was it like freshly <laughs> waxed wood? Like, there's a lot of variables that go into this, so we have yet to see the it's 30 for 30. It's an investigating, or a developing story, right. I should right? say. Yeah. I'm waiting for, like, the 30 for 30 to be, like, the step that, <laughs> hurt, that, like, that broke Dustin Johnson. Uh, Corey says golf is definitely a game of the head. I totally agree with that. <laughs> Adam picking on me right off the bat says, Baxter, what's worse to, what's worse to watch, golf or baseball? The question, Mac, to you, Adam, is am I watching it in person or am I watching it at home? I mean, I need to know the specifics here. I can't just throw out a willy-nilly answer to something like that. I, uh, both are painful. <laughs> both um, are slow. Both are slow. Both are painful. Which would I rather play more? Like, there's a lot of variables here, Adam. So you gotta you got to give me a little bit more specifics here if you want me to, to get back at you with that kind of an answer. But I appreciate the question, though. Uh, keep those questions coming. Make sure to hit that share button as well, too. Uh, we're going to be talking to Mitch Vomhoff here in just a minute about the NBA playoffs. That's Megan. That's James over there. we got a lot of great stuff coming for you. The next big thing, Megan's boyfriend, Tim Tebow, <laughs> is getting ready to... 
Did you need a moment there? No, yeah. no, <laughs> just was not expecting that. Continue. continue. <laughs> Tim Tebow, uh, for those that know, signed a minor league contract deal in the New York Mets system to play with the Fireflies. Seems kind of fitting, honestly, uh, <laughs> to play uh, single-A baseball. He's going to make his debut this week. My question to both of you is, number one, do you care? And number two, how is he going to do? Do that's, I? That's, of, of course I care. It's Tim Tebow. I love Tim. <laughs> Um, we go way back. Yeah. Love Tim. I'm, I'm always rooting for Tim, you know, no matter what situation. <laughs> it didn't work out with the football thing. We're going to give baseball a shot. You Why know, not? You know, sure. Like, go ahead. Play baseball. I don't know. I mean, am I going to be, like, sitting there, like, watching every game, like, looking up all his stats? No. But, I mean, sure. Have fun. I don't know. <laughs> so, basically, you're Get happy out there. for him, but you don't care. No, I mean... I I care from a distance. Can okay. you do that? Like I'm a, I'm a casual fan. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Some of the quotes here too. Um, one of the gentlemen that is a part of the organization came out and said that he's like he brings a lot of experience to the table, which I'm a little confused uh, on. I think more than anything, he'll bring motivation and a spark um, he to the team. That's it. That makes more, yeah, it does. He brings marketing dollars. I mean, how many Tim Tebow Firefly right. jerseys are going to now fly off the shelf because of that? Which for both sides in the team and him, you can't really. You can't really fault them because, again, football didn't work. Right. Did you, you believe? If you have the opportunity to play baseball, you go, you take it, of course. Absolutely. Did you believe him back in October on Good Morning America when he said that he had more of a passion for baseball than for football? I mean, what what are you supposed to say? I mean, that's like You're if I get on like, a baseball. I'm working here in broadcasting, <laughs> yeah. but if I decided to get into swimming tomorrow, I'd be like, I am way more passionate about <laughs> swimming than I ever was about broadcasting. Absolutely. Obviously, it's like, okay, he's saying what he needed to right. say to help mm-hmm. plead his case because if he said, well, no, I still love football a lot. Mets, nobody would have probably been like, right. well, why would we want to sign this guy if he's more concerned about football than right. playing baseball? I mean, you don't want him spending his time in your organization, like, talking about football or promoting that, you know, that sport. Obviously, it's got to be all about baseball. So for Tim Tebow going all in and saying, yeah, I've, of course, I've always been passionate about baseball. I don't think you can fault him for that. No, I don't think so, honestly. It, it's it's great to see this, though. He's, he's always kind of been, though, a victim of his own popularity, and, and we're going to see – Every home run he hits, and then we're going to freak out about it. (laughs) But ultimately, it's not going to mean anything. Nobody else in the entire world can hit a home run at 1A baseball and have it featured on SportsCenter. Like, that just doesn't make any sense. But But you know as soon as he does it, as you mentioned, it's going to be this big, huge thing like Tebow shines for the Fireflies. And in the same breath that it's awesome he's getting that recognition, everybody also almost hates him for it because it's like, come on, this is 1A. Stop talking about this. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's just it. I mean, the headline pops across the ESPN, right. you know, screen today that Tim Tebow's, you know, going to baseball, single A baseball, and you're like, no other player who signs right. for single A is going to get <laughs> a headline on ESPN. No, but... no, 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 not at all. That's that is that's obviously the thing. Staying right. with baseball here briefly. Sorry, as we got to move along, guys. Is uh, Derek Jeter? Um, so if you're if you're a fan of Derek Jeter, I've always loved him. He was one of the few reasons I kind of ish cared about baseball right. as a kid. Kind of ish, ish. <laughs> drafted. I always was drafted him when I played backyard baseball. Derek Jeter was there. It had to be that starting shortstop for me of back course. in the day. I had Pablo in the outfield, and I had uh, you know A Rod at third, and Barry Bonds. I, I, had, the, I had the best <laughs> you know backyard baseball team back in the day. But Derek Jeter apparently is coming out saying that he is interested in helping buy a part of the Miami Marlins. Now the Marlins need as much help as they can possibly get, and I am all for this move because there's a guy that knows how to win that's going to make an organization successful and put yeah. them on the map. It's your man mm-hmm. Derek Jeter right there. Right. Your reactions to when you hear Derek Jeter trying to get into the owning business, and of all teams, Miami. Right. Well, I mean, Miami's a team that, that has talent. It's just they're, that they haven't put it together yet. And the, the thing about him owning and helping, and whenever you think about a player – especially a player of that caliber owning a team and helping a team, you have to think of Jordan and the struggles that he had in the beginning. So it, the real determination is how hands-on is he going to be? That is, is the big be, thing, yes. Is, and how much, is, you know, how much of an owner's stake is he going to have? Is he going to have a real you know, face of the organization? Is he going to have a real hand in developing and picking talent? Or is he just kind of getting into this business as, as a second opportunity to be involved in baseball? Yeah, I think it's definitely interesting, obviously, for the Marlins. I mean, that's great for them because the publicity there, you know, people are definitely going to be interested to see what kind of role Derek Jeter has, and they'll be tuning in. You know, they're going to want to know what role he has. But, again, um, I'd be careful to say that Jeter's their answer or, like, the person who's going to bail them out because you really don't know. Um, Just because you played a sport doesn't necessarily mean you have the leadership skills, you have the business skills, you have, you know, all of these – 
there's a lot that goes into managing, you know, a team or like being in the ownership position. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, so I'm hesitant to say like, oh, he'll be great. But I mean, for Miami, why not? I mean, I, you know, uh, I, again, instant again, drop. I, I mean, right. You, you know, you have the marketing dollars, you have the money. Well, well what, just to play devil's advocate, what if he decides to move the team? What if he decides to buy enough of the team that he can then justify trying to pull the team out of an awful baseball I mean, market that is Miami? Can they get out of that stadium, though? That is the big question, <laughs> yeah. though. I mean, they got, they got a freaking waterfall on the outfield. Right. How, I mean, I mean it's hard to just trying, pick up and leave. But it... I mean, Miami is, is not a great baseball town for a, a number of reasons. And it would be interesting to see if he would maybe try that. I don't necessarily know, you know, where he would go with that. If he, There's a lot of variables that go into that. So. Of course. You know, it's just kind of I. I'm just interested to see first if he does this and if he, you know, how he, how he does with the start of it, and then see where he takes it. Yeah, that's the big thing for me too is to try to figure out where exactly, you know, this is actually going to do. Is this uh, this is a great move by Miami? Yeah. If you want to get mm-hmm. a guy, if you want to make your your team relevant again, I mean, there's nobody better than a guy like Derek Jeter to try to come in and shake things up. That makes total sense to me, honestly. So. Why not put all your chips in the basket and see if Jeter can be that answer, right. that, that, I mean, that savior he's, he's for you? He's baseball royalty. I mean, mm-hmm. exactly. there's not a baseball fan alive that doesn't know who Derek Jeter is. That's Yeah, if there's one name that a lot of people know who it is. It's Derek right. Jeter, that's for sure. All right, let's move along to the wide world of basketball. And there's a man that is at the forefront of everything taking place. Uh, he is the host of Double Dribble here on a Friday evenings on the Brew Sports Network. Uh, a good friend and colleague, it is Mitch Vomhoff. Uh, Mitch, a good Thursday to you, sir. We welcome you to the program. How is life for Mitch today, sir? Exactly, and that's the big thing that we wanted to talk about to you with you today, Mitch, is uh, looking at the standings right now in both the East and the West. Uh, still four teams looking to lock up a place in the Eastern Conference, only one left in the West. What are you looking more forward to, to kind of look ahead here, to which playoffs are you looking more forward to, the Eastern Conference or the Western Conference, based off of the eight teams proposed at the moment to get in, or even the teams that are on the outside trying to get in, but who ultimately is going to put on the better show come playoff time? Yeah, I mean, the Western Conference has always been that um, surprise, I feel like, in, in the sense that you always know exactly what you're going to get. When you're, it's never really that surprising. It's like, okay, like, it's the Western Conference. We know the West is going to always be this big, great thing. And since Steph Curry's been in the league as well, too, I don't think anybody has really been that shocked, being like, oh, okay, wow, all of a sudden the Warriors are great. Like, it did kind of feel like, to an extent, that they just kind of all shifted all of a sudden. It's like, whoa, who are the Golden State Warriors? <laughs> I honestly forgot they were a team until Steph Curry and Clay Thompson decided to take over the team. Right. But, I, I mean, what can you really say about these playoffs, though, James? I mean, there's a lot of great stuff coming up, that's for there sure. There is a lot. And, and, you know, in the East, you have to think, you know, the Bucks, the Hawks, uh, still the Pacers, they're all kind of battling for that fifth spot. And you also you, you wonder – if you get that fifth spot, even if you get out of the first round, you, you have to face the Cavs. So it's yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so now it's like, do you really want the five? Do you want to go six? I mean, it's. I don't. I don't necessarily we finally, know. We finally have that that uh, kind of competition in the East, but it's also still ahead of the pack. Is still ab- above everyone else is the Cavs. So it's it's almost like we're they're trying to plan how. You know how they're going to figure out where they're going to where they're going to seat, and if they do get out of the first round, mm-hmm. you know what happens. Then you then you face LeBron. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean, I was even reading an article uh, earlier today that was already forecasting. Well, what are the Celtics going to do next year to try to take out LeBron? Like they already just kind of wiped <laughs> the floor on. They basically just given up gonna... at this point. Well, yeah, and, and after the game last night, I think people are kind of starting to think like. Oh, maybe the Celtics can't hang with the Cavaliers when LeBron is is in full force like he was. 
Um, and I'm afraid that might actually be the mentality that's going on right now. Is is LeBron the only superstar that seems to get bullied? I mean, it's like the media <laughs> is after him. You know, I'm not the hugest LeBron yeah. fan, but you got Charles Barkley going after him. Now you got Dennis Rodman complaining about him resting, and it's like every time you know, every time they poke the bear. LeBron yeah. comes out like last night and says, just a reminder. Watch you know, me. I've yeah. been to the last, what, five Eastern mm-hmm. Conference finals or fi- five finals? Last six, six uh, yeah. finals. Last six. Yeah, yeah. last six, six finals. Six straight, so yes. keep, keep complaining about me resting. And, 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 and all of a sudden, you know, he goes off. I think, yeah, that's, I think that's earned, though. I mean, I'm not saying that every <laughs> other superstar is, like, perfect or anything, but I think that's just part of what comes with being the superstar. I mean, people will complain, maybe not to the extent, but, right. you know, you'll still hear complaints about Tom Brady. You know, you'll hear these complaints about LeBron, and it's just, it comes with the territory. When you're good, people are frustrated. They're kind of like, this guy again, you know, you hear, I mean, to be fair, you hear a lot of LeBron, right? I mean, he He's, does do a lot of complaints. He makes, too. like, how many highlights on, you know, they talk about him, of course. like, the whole sports center, like, right? So, I mean, it's never the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's like LeBron and the Cavs are in Oakland last right. night to take on the Warriors. It's like, no, it's not like the Cavaliers. It's like, no, LeBron and it's like, you know, right. Hootie and the Blowfish. It's like there's always <laughs> yeah. that one man, and then it's the rest of the, like, the backup right. singers behind him, basically, yeah. with LeBron James. Mitch, do you feel, though, like, I mean, not to get off on a LeBron tangent here, but let's be honest, LeBron is good for the NBA, though. He's making it relevant, is, is he not? Oh, lost Mitch for some reason. What the heck? I don't know what happened to Mitch, but uh, I mean, we'll have to figure that out in a moment. To, to answer your question, of course, he's good for for the NBA, and, and he, you know, like I said, he is kind of that only, because I don't remember, you know, the media coming after Jordan like this, and and that's part of the problem. That well, do you think the media has gotten harsher though over the last no, couple of years? No, the media has become more involved. Is yes, is yep. the issue? So instead of just having the media sit on a television screen when you're talking about the Jordan era, now you have the media who all have Twitter accounts and they have you know Facebook things and they're asking fans comments and the fans can criticize you too, and it's become so much more involved. So it's not that the media, in my opinion, is harsher. It's just there's a lot more of it and there's a lot more more. critics that are kind of coming out of the woodwork and suddenly everyone has an opinion and that's really what blows up the issue right that is the big thing honestly uh when you think about it the media continues to get bigger and better and everybody is the first one to pull out their phones and be like what did you say (laughs) like here look at snap snap like twitter everybody helped it the players also have their phones out. Exactly, responding. yeah. Or Antonio Brown's in the locker room, like, yeah, what's coach saying now? Like, woo, like, that's like, you, Jordan wouldn't have done that. Scotty no, Pippen I, wouldn't sure, have done that. I'm Dennis sure. Rodman may would have, probably, <laughs> yeah, but like, this doesn't, this is such a different age that right. we live in now. I'm sure Jordan had a, a lot to say about how his team con- was constructed and who he wanted and this and that. And a lot like LeBron does. It just wasn't, just wasn't out in the open. Right, right. That, is, that is the big thing. So when you guys look at the NBA as a whole right now, the gentleman that continues to make headlines left and right is Russell Westbrook. Will he be the MVP? Will he overtake James Harden? Will the Thunder be relevant? Blah, blah, blah. What do you make of all of this Russell Westbrook talk? Uh, to me, there's no way he's not the MVP. I mean, I, I guess the MVP is always is a, is a crazy award because I guess if you really were to break it down, who's the most valuable player, it would be LeBron every year. That, that is true. I mean, he is the most valuable player in the league. Six straight finals. Wherever he goes, he's in the finals. So, of course, yes, he's he's the MVP. So, is it more who's the most outstanding player this year? Then, yet, then it's Russell Westbrook. It's without a doubt. I mean, it's been what fifty six years, I believe, since uh, Oscar Robinson and the, and being the only guy to average a triple double for an entire season. Right. If if Westbrook is able to do that, and it looks like he's going to, I don't know. I don't know how you don't give him the MVP. But taking taking into account that the year. Oscar Robinson did that. He did not win the MVP. That's the thing. So. I mean, and, he, and this is the times are totally different at the same point. And we, we talked about this, I think, yesterday on Happy Hour about how the 61, you know, 61 62 season when Oscar Robertson right. was running back and forth doing all these incredible numbers, they didn't have the three point line back right. then. Russell Westbrook has that opportunity to hit the three and then also drive inside and do everything that he does I at mean, that but point, he, too. Westbrook had, what was it, 57 points and yeah. still had a triple double? He had 13 assists. I mean, if you just do the math, he was responsible for, like, almost 80 points. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how, is, how can you not say that that guy is the most valuable person? That is the big thing, honestly, is, like, 
when we had this conversation last night too, and I want to get your guys' opinion on this as well too, what makes an MVP nowadays? Because every sport I feel like has a different MVP. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. in the sense of what it takes to be the MVP. You talk about football, it's usually a quarterback. You talk uh, about team. yeah, you talk yeah. about baseball, it's usually the Cy Young winner is usually mm -hmm. a player that is doing exceptionally well. But then you look at the exception of the rule like Mike Trout, what are the Angels? What have they done the mm -hmm. last couple of years? Right. Hardly anything, but Mike Trout continues to win the most valuable mm -hmm. player because he goes yard fifty plus times a yeah. year and is driving in RBIs left and right. It's an interesting award, I just want to say, just because of most valuable players. So, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean value to fans? Does it mean value to leagues? Does it mean value to your team? Who who are you valuable to? I mean, if you're talking, you know, because then you get into the issue of, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, Mike Trout or whatever, um, and being on a team that maybe isn't great, but he's still doing outstanding things as an individual. Should your team's success play a role in that? And I think a lot of teams really struggle with, you know, okay, you know, um, is the most valuable player going to, you know, automatically elevate a team and put them in the playoffs? Is that yeah. their role? Is their role to get numbers, to, you know, sell um, tickets? What what really makes them valuable? And I think that's a hard thing to define, and I think that's why a lot of times you'll have a lot of conflict when it comes to, okay, who really is the most valuable player in the league? Yes, for, exactly. For baseball, one of the things that's kind of muddied the water is, is analytics and, and stats like war, you know, wins above replacement, <laughs> like which I – I don't understand. I never understood <laughs> the whole war conversation, honestly. I mean, Mike Trout has a ridiculous uh, war statistic, so that's why he ends up winning. Does that make know. him a hero? Like, should he, get a, <laughs> should he get a medal or something? I don't know how that works, honestly. I think we got Mitch back here as well, too. Uh, Mitch, what do you make of this whole MVP conversation and all the uh, yeah. craziness that goes along with it? I mean, it's, it's real interesting because I think the leagues kind of intentionally don't define most valuable player just so we have discussions like this. Um it's it, you know it, it's obviously kind of vague and that leaves it open to interpretation by a lot of the voters um that said i'm still standing by my russell westbrook averages a triple double he gets the mvp uh take especially now that he's on the verge of breaking the single season uh triple double record um but the other actually interesting component to mvp voting at least in uh, the nba is that um the, the league just took uh, team o or uh, I should say team employed um, media personalities, so like broadcasters, announcers, off of voting for league awards, which, which is, is smart. Of, yeah, it's it's definitely smart because especially as awards start to play into uh, yeah, especially with the new CBA, it, it it really makes a difference now. Yeah, yeah, and when players have contract options that say if you're an All NBA player, then you get this extra bonus. All of a sudden, you have guys voting basically for pay raises for players, and that kind of gets. Right, exactly, and I think that's where some of the conspiracy has been with why LeBron or anybody that's won the MVP recently has been so successful is because they're almost stuff in the ballot box as well right. at that point. I mean, I think with with the MVP, there there is a legitimate argument for uh, James Harden. Oh yeah, he he is having a, an amazing season. They are doing better than than the uh, Thunder, but you know, it's like you said, if if he averages the triple double, I don't know how I don't know how you yeah. don't give him the award. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. I mean, you can't have that type of a career year and not be handed that sort right. of award. I don't care if your team is in first place or in dead last and whatever conference that you're but in. But that's where that kind of weighs in on how much, you know, the most valuable player do you have to be on on the most successful team as well because you see that in football. Right. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? I mean, mm -hmm. Mitch, you followed the NBA for a long time. I mean, do you agree with the fact that if you are an MVP, you should at least be on a playoff team? I mean, it's – the way they define MVP today, and then kind of the way they have historically, has always been the best guy on a playoff team. And it's, just, it's kind of like which best guy is the overall best guy. Um, and so, yeah, so team success obviously factors into it. Um, somebody posed an interesting question today uh, when I was uh, checking out some conversations on Twitter uh, of if, let's say, a guy like Anthony Davis, who obviously puts up amazing stats and is like maybe one of the best players in the NBA, contributes to a bunch of wins, but pelicans don't make the playoffs like how valuable are those wins right that is a good point well, and that the whole discussion of like it's wins aren't created equal um and you know like i said it's kind of intentionally vague it, it lets people kind of build their own narratives um and i often think the strongest narrative uh maybe has a little bit more impact than the straight up best player i also wonder you know with like an anthony davis for example you know adding cousins to me immediately takes away from his MVP abilities. I don't think that Steph 
could win MVP at this point. No. I mean, you you just added Kevin Durant, and mm-hmm. you have Clay Thompson, and that team is stacked. So how how can I say that – you're the most valuable of that of that superstar team. Exactly, I, I can't under, I can't argue against that. Even with Steph making his ridiculous, you know, behind the back right. passes from basically half court at this point in the season. But it's too. definitely now easier because you're making behind the back passes to all stars. Right, exactly. Draymond Green knew where to be on that right. regards. It wasn't like he just threw up a pair to a rookie who right. just was in the right place. You're at not the right throwing time. those to Zaza Pachulia. You're throwing those to Kevin Durant. <laughs> exactly. That that <laughs> is the Zaza honest truth. Behind the back pass once. I almost died. <laughs> Did he complete the pass? I don't. I mean, that's it the wasn't real question. An accident. No. <laughs> of course not. I think he hit a fan. <laughs> yeah, probably like ah. All right, Mitch. Well, uh, before we let you run here really fast, um, you basically already told us who your MVP vote is, but yeah. uh, can you give us a quick prediction in terms of who you think the uh, conference representatives are going to be uh, when it's all said and done come the NBA Finals? I know we're still a little bit out, but as the things are, as the teams are starting to sort to get you know sorted out, who the eight teams in each conference are going to be. Uh, can you give us at least uh, your before the playoff prediction? <laughs> this is going to sound like such a cop out, but I still <laughs> firmly believe we are going to come down to a Cavaliers Warriors finals. Um, there's just the Houston Rockets are great, the Celtics are great, the Raptors are great. You still have t- exactly two Titans in in basketball today, and they're going to meet up again. And I'm really looking forward to that matchup. I mean, barring injury, yeah, there's, yeah. there's yeah, no yeah. real... Yeah, obviously the injury asterisk is there, but... If there's no injury, or, I mean, mm-hmm. even if there is an injury, there'd probably still be those two, but... Right, I agree yeah. with you on that one. Definitely. All right, Mitch, well, good stuff from you, sir. Uh, where can people continue to find you and uh, also follow you on the social media um, networks as well? You can continue to follow me at Mitch Vomhoff on Twitter, and you can find me tomorrow night, uh, around this time, actually, at 5 p.m. Central, that's 6 p.m. Eastern, on the Double Dribble Basketball Show with my good friend Jimmy Carlton. What, what? Love it, Mitch. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon, sir. All right. Sounds great. Talk to you guys soon. No problem. There goes Mitch Vomhoff here on Happy Hour. Good insight from him. We always appreciate him swinging by the program. Uh, moving right along here with some of the uh, other latest and greatest headlines. Uh, Megan, you brought this story to our attention here before we went on the air. Uh, in regards to an old UW Badger alum, uh, former running back for the Denver Broncos, Mr. Monte Ball. What is going on with Mr. Ball? Yeah, so Mr. Ball has recently admitted that he is an alcoholic. Um, yeah, which is a little bit rough. If you remember, um, towards the end of his NFL career, he was getting into a little bit of trouble. Um, he had some battery charges against him and was kind of going with these domestic violence issues. So he is no longer in the NFL. But um, the good news for Ball is that he has admitted to his problems. Um, he, according to you know his uh, Rep is seeking treatment, and he's actually back enrolled in school. So wow. it seems like he's on the up and up. Which he's on is the, the right goodness. path. I mean, I, I've really felt like Monte Ball just kind of vanished, and now that he's kind yeah. of emerged from the depths, this is this is a good thing for him. But according to the article too that uh, you had referenced in the news stories, he was he was drinking almost excessively, basically yep. four or five times a week, which we do that already here on, on Brew Sports <laughs> as a whole. And I mean, my performance is yet to fully dwindle, but <laughs> some people just can't handle their alcohol, I guess, Monty. No, in, in all serious though, it's good to know that he is actually getting the help that he needs because alcoholism is certainly something that you don't ever want to sure. mess around mm-hmm. with. And this is just, you know, another uh, prime example of, you know, kid coming out of college and, and just not Maybe physically ready. He's maybe he might be physically ready to go to the pros, but he's not mentally ready. I mean, it's a whole new, it's a whole new world. There's obviously a ton of money, so it, it's it's a sad story because you know being from Wisconsin, of course, you wanted Monte Ball to be to be good, and uh, I of course had him on my fantasy team, so I was kind of upset about that. But you know, at least he's out here getting the help. You know, making making decisions to to fix any any issues that he had. Well, that's the big thing, too, is the fact that he has taken the steps to go and correct the issues that have been going on. But not to stray on a different tangent off of this, though, this is just another tally in the failed Badger running backs in the NFL, unfortunately. I mean, aside from James White, James though, White, I mean. <laughs> what is anybody? And I think James White would have probably been voted least likely to succeed out right. of, you know, Monte Ball, Ron <laughs> Dane, Melvin Gordon. I mean, I don't know how many people had James White on top of their list no. to first to win a Super Bowl out of those gatherings. Gordon's still got a chance. I he mean, does. Yeah. Whenever San Diego figure out who the heck they yeah. are, L.A. now or whatever they are, <laughs> the Chargers. You know, it kind of, and to kind of go back on just the ball topic, I kind of want to present a question to you guys. 
how much does the I mean I don't care the NFL Major League Baseball NBA how much do they play a role in helping these players transition I mean is it you know you kind of look at it and you're like well they're adults let them figure it out or should there be kind of like help in you know how do you handle yourself how do you handle money I mean you're, you're still talking about giving you know 21 22 year olds all this money all this fame you know there there's a lot of hype surrounding some of them and you're just kind of like tossing them out there is there any social responsibility to these players i mean you know the nfl has the rookie symposium and all that so so they do they do enough for us to know that they're doing something but at the same time these guys are they are adults i mean i of course feel bad for the situation but they they do have to kind of make their own decisions and then figure out, you know, maybe it's up to the veterans on the team to, to mentor these guys or, or maybe it's up to them to go and find a mentor. Right, and that's the thing, too. When you really think about this, how many players actually are worried about their mental stability? They care about how fast their bank accounts can fill right. up, unfortunately. That's why we see the one and dones in college basketball. I mean, you could be literally the worst person in terms of mental stability and or just managing finances, but you're like, I just want to go play in the NBA so I can now have more than, uh, you know, 25 bucks in my <laughs> account because I'm a college kid. Like, 18-year-olds don't need $20 million. No, they, they don't. They just don't. <laughs> I don't care what you're doing with your life. You just don't need that much money, and that is I, I think there should be rules put in place to limit the amount of money a rookie can be paid in any sport or even a second-year guy in any sport because – these guys are still young. I don't care if they're coming right out of college uh, I mean, the, after being the there thing, for four years or being a freshman. The thing is, though, even even at the the league minimum, that's still more money than they have ever. Right. Had. I, mean, so, I mean, the 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 minimum wage for an NFL player is five hundred thousand right. dollars. I mean, you can still do a lot of damage with five hundred thousand dollars. It's not <laughs> like you can say, "All right, here's, here's I mean, you give here's me five hundred thousand. It's going to fix a lot of problems." For uh, yeah, <laughs> same here. I can pay off all my college loans and all that other stuff. But like, if we, you can't, but you can't give a pro athlete like forty k. You just can't. Right. No, right. you can't. I mean, I mean they'll be like, hey, really? Like, <laughs> are you serious? $40,000 to, to, to play in the NBA? you got to play like, for the love of the game, right? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I thought you loved the game, man. <laughs> that's why part. you played in college. Like, no, that's why I went to school for a year and left. Right. Didn't even go to class, <laughs> which also blows my mind as well, too. I want to move away from Monte Ball, though, and we certainly wish him the very speediest of recoveries, of course, with everything that he's got going on. And I want to talk about a polarizing yet exciting figure in the NFL, Richard Sherman. Uh, apparently, and I never thought I'd see this day, but the Seahawks are looking to move Richard Sherman. They're looking to trade him. And my question, number one, is why? And number two, what would you be willing to pay for him? I mean, it, it's, it's got to be money, right? I mean, th that's the, the problem with winning is everybody starts to cost money. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> he's a, a two-time Super Bowl yeah. veteran, and he has a ring right. under his belt as well. And in the NFL, once you win, your quarterback gets paid, and that – severely changes what you can do with the rest of your roster. Right. That That is the big thing. Seattle has already come out and said that they want a, quote, really good player and a <laughs> high-level draft pick for Richard Sherman. What do you classify as a really good player? I don't it's know. Of, it's like, but, it, you know, I mean, to the Seahawks' credit, it's kind of like the blanket term. It's like, all right, let's see who we can get out yeah. of this. Let's kind of, you know, test the market, right. see who people are willing to give up. You know, so sure, I'll take a high-level player. <laughs> and a high draft pick. So my my thought to this is that he was probably worth a second or a third round draft pick, and right. what in the Seahawks' minds. And then I'm trying to think who a good a good a really good player would be well, from that's the, the Packers. Thing, where are you, where if I if I'm if I'm the Packers, just because that's what I know the best, I would. What am I comfortable giving up? Am I comfortable giving up a Randall Cobb? Is that a really good player to help fill their issues at wide receiver? Sure. I I don't know. Well, I mean, I'd be willing to give up Randall Cobb for him, of course. But I mean, you're gonna need you're gonna you're gonna need to be you're going to give up picks. That's what you're going to. That's what they're going to get back. If they do, if they do anything, they're going to get back picks. Because think about it. If you're trading him for a really good player, right? Who are you trading with? Are you trading with a bad team? Because then you're just swapping really good players. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really benefit a bad team unless they're getting more than just him out of it. So they're giving away a really good player and giving away picks. So you're not swapping with a bad that's, team. That's the right. thing. Are you going to take a a good player on a bad team plus a, a pick? I mean, then you're going to make out like a good like a bandit basically. Right. Be like, sweet, we got one of your best players and we got a high level draft pick. But like teams that like the Cleveland Browns or the Jaguars. I mean, yeah, some of those teams have you know, good players, but Cleveland especially. Like, but it doesn't make sense to give away. A good player plus draft picks it, when you're a bad team. It doesn't make sense to give away your future for a player that's right. good right now. I mean, you know, you could make the argument, look, Jacksonville's on the up and up, and in a few years maybe they'll get there. But 
in a few years, you don't know what Richard Sherman's going to be no, worth. No, nobody does. You a don't corner know if, you also know, isn't going to fix it. A cornerback's not going to fix it. Right, You're not trading right. for a, a quarterback. No. Right. Well, the the big thing with all of this, I think that some folks are, and I think this is why Seattle's trying to cash in on this, is that Sherman is a product of a very good system. Right. <laughs> I could go play cornerback for the Seahawks if I had <laughs> Earl Thomas – sitting behind me covering my butt like yeah, I, I, realistically I when you've got all pro corners and cam chancellor and earl yeah. thomas playing back up behind you you're gonna be a good corner I, no one's gonna throw to your side of the field and i think people you know when you read the headline and you're like richard why would they give him up and i think that's why because seattle's looking at their team and they're going look we have a good defense. We have a sound defense. We know how to, like you said, we have a good system. They do. We can, it's very good. Right. We can we can create good players. We can do this without Richard Sherman. So why not get rid of your one good player when you still have a really good defense and then take someone else and coach them up? I mean, why wouldn't you if you're Seattle? Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, of course, every team out there is thinking, going, hmm, do I want him on my team? Do I want the – the talk back, do I want right. the fired up guy on my team? And most people are like, I can look past that. <laughs> I mean, if I'm a Packers fan, I'm sitting there going, yeah, we've yeah. got a lot of holes yeah. that Richard Sherman yeah. would yeah. close up real quickly. I mean, I, I honestly would be fine if, if Ted Thompson came out tomorrow, which we know won't happen, and say, all right, Seattle, here's our second-round draft pick and Randall Cobb. I was going to say, good luck with Ted. That's, right. And that's the big <laughs> thing with Adrian Peterson. That's the big thing, of course, now with Richard Sherman as well. Packer fans, it's fun. To, it's you're, you're window shopping. You're like right. something shiny, but then it's like your parent being like, "No, no, no, Megan. Like, come on, we need <laughs> to go home." You're like, "But, but, but." Like, no, like that's it's not going to happen, unfortunately. <laughs> but that does beg the other question now. Adrian Peterson. It came out today, a couple hours ago, that he's planning to visit the the New Orleans Saints today or this week, rather. Right. What do you put into that? Because he was working out with Buccaneer players last week. He visited the Patriots earlier this week, and now he's going to the Saints. Not exactly a team I had on my radar because they've got a young, budding Mark Ingram, but we've also talked about this to you know in, in length that he needs to go to a team that has a good one-two punch, right. and he would be that good one-two punch with Mark Ingram for the Saints, who basically don't have anybody on that team anymore to help Drew Brees out. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the Saints, too, that – AP's not the best running back out of the shotgun, so that immediately changes their offense, which that's why the Saints don't necessarily make sense to me. They're a passing team. Yes, mm -hmm. Ingram's going to run the ball, but it's out of shotgun. It's out of – Right. It, it's, it's more misdirection than anything. It's, it's not line up and smash mouth. So the same thing with the Patriots. I mean, the first two downs, you see LeGarrette Brunt, but after that, it's, it's all scat backs. So that's where I think AP's in trouble. It's – it's hard to just, in my opinion, like James is saying, it's hard to justify picking up a player. And I, you know, look, AP is a good football player. He yes. had success behind him. Is he st stellar anymore? Does he still have a lot in him? I don't know. But it's hard to justify changing your whole system and changing your offense and kind of allowing, you know, changing your identity to allow this one player to come in. Especially when he has a price tag. I mean, right. he's, he's right. not he wants that $8 million It's a not year. like you're sitting there like, let's test this out. This right. is a new guy. No, like you, like you said, you're giving up a significant amount to have this player, and now you've got to kind of put in all this extra work, redo things, relook at things. I mean, you know where he'd be perfect is – the Titans, there. We're going to run the ball. That's what we're going to do. Well, they've already got, they've got DeMarco Murray and Derrick Henry, though. Right. They're, they're so, set. <laughs> this so isn't, this isn't yeah, Philly a couple why. years ago where you're using three or four running backs right. with Chip Kelly's offense. But that's well, why he's in trouble because there's not, there's not that many teams that are willing to just, if they're not already running teams, why bring in AP? Exactly. And I, I took a gander at one team that I was curious about. I looked at the Indianapolis Colts and their depth chart. Uh, Frank Gore is their starting running back right now, who kind of had a, a reemergence yeah. last year, which I think was great for him and the Colts, even though they finished 8-8 eight and eight last season. But Andrew Luck, I feel like, needs a more dominant threat than Frank Gore in the backfield. You've got T.Y. Hilton. You've got Dante Moncrief as your wide receivers. Not, not terrible. You know, T.Y. Hilton, of right. course, is always one of those top five to six fantasy wide receivers every year would ap fit in in a dome team he's already used to playing in a dome team in the afc in a division that frankly isn't that good right i mean that that wouldn't be a bad landing spot because like you said frank Gore is I, I don't know how much longer frank Gore has left we thought he was done when he got there but the last couple seasons he's kind of surprised and had quiet quietly good seasons but AP there would, would actually be a pretty good fit because then you could take some of that pressure off of uh, Andrew Luck. And their receivers aren't – they're good, but they aren't those big, you know, security receivers. They're quick, fast, 
you know, across the middle, deep pass. And it's, that's the thing, especially with them trading away their uh, decent tight end that they had right. to the Patriots Dwayne as Allen, well, right. too, Dwayne Allen. That was your security blanket underneath for Andrew Luck, and all of a sudden it's like, ah, we don't need him anymore either. So if I'm Andrew Luck, I'm going into the season going, I'm going to need a stronger running game to bail me out while I try to find T.Y. 80 yards down the field right. on a fly pattern every other play. <laughs> the Colts are an interesting option, too, just because, you know, when you're talking about team identity, I think that's a really – that's a team that is struggling with that um, just because – you never really quite know where Andrew Luck is going to land. You know, he can be, I mean, he can be on fire. He can be, you know, connecting to every player. He can be one of the best. Or, you know, he can be one of the worst. He, you know, has a serious interception problem. He makes, you know, choices that are questionable. You know, he takes he a lot of hits. You know, so there are things like that. So I think with the Colts, it's kind of hard to almost figure out your offense or figure out where you're all going just because you don't quite know where your quarterback's going to be at that particular year, that game, and you kind of have to formulate around a big uncertainty, I think. I've got one other team that I'm curious to get your thoughts about. Staying in the AFC, what about the Baltimore Ravens? 8-8 eight and eight last season. Terrence West is your starting running back. We thought Justin Forsett was going to be this godsend. He got injury-ridden. Right. Ray Rice, of course, we all know that story. Not a terrible idea. You're he talking could, about a team a that would upgrade, he sure. would, and you're talking about a team that, and you could still go one two Peterson West. West was decent at times last year, but you talk about a Baltimore team that was in the you know at the top of the tier for a long time defensively. They have taken a lot of steps back, of for course, sure. but this is still a team that finished second last year in the AFC North. They've got a lot of promise. I mean, you've got Pittsburgh in front of you, of course, who's got Le'Veon Bell, but then Cincinnati can't figure themselves out for the life of them. And then Cleveland, we're not going to have that conversation right now. So <laughs> would Baltimore be an option for Adrian Peterson? I mean, if he's got multiple years left, then, then yeah, because you also got to realize that Big Ben is already talking about re retirement. So, I mean, once he leaves, who is going to come in? That's a wide-open division, you feel like. I mean, yeah, they'll be able to run the ball. They still, they'll still have Antonio Brown. Still have the defense, but again, you you can't you can't do it without a quarterback. So, and he's no slouch. True, that so is that is that, that is division, the honest truth that about that. Definitely opens up if he if he decides to walk away in the next year or two. That is a good point. Yeah, one of the other teams, and this is the last team that I want to throw at you guys, is the Houston Texans. It seems like everybody's trying to put a chip on Houston <laughs> this year. I mean. Frankly, if Houston doesn't Who win don't seven, don't we want to go to Houston? It's like everyone. We talk everybody about wants they, to go to Houston. I don't even know if Houston's sitting there going like, "Yeah, everyone, we want them." Like, I don't think everyone wants to go. I think we as the, like, the we, media, yeah, want as the media is like, "Yes, go to Houston, go to Houston." I, I'm not buying what Houston's trying to sell, but another good one-two combination: Adrian Peterson and Lamar Miller. Yeah, that's not a bad one-two kind of a combination right there. He's already from the South as a whole. You know, went to school in Oklahoma. He's from Texas as well, too. That was the rumor about him going to Dallas maybe right. as well. But Zeke Elliott is far too good of a running back to try right. to share the carries. But Lamar Miller, not an elite running back, not a game changer, but still a good complementary player if you've got Adrian Peterson as your second guy that's you, getting the ball. If you're AP and you still have a choice, if you have no choice, of course you go there. But if you still have a choice, are you? do you want to go somewhere where you – to this day, we don't know who their starting quarterback is going to be. That's the big thing. Is it Tom Savage or Brandon Whedon? And that's the thing. More than likely, they're going to draft a guy here in the next right. you know, three weeks. Either and they're going to draft a rookie and you know, feed him to the Wolves, or they're going to sit him and go with Tom Savage. Tom Savage isn't terrible. Okay, sorry. I, I tried. <laughs> I tried to convince you. But I, I agree with you on that one, though. I mean, Houston is a special team in the sense that you don't really know what you're right. going to get. Defensively, they've got some good players, of course. I mean, but of course, Watt and Clowney. Watt and yeah. Clowney. The rumors that they might even go out and try to draft T.J. Watt as well, too. I mean, Jonathan Joseph is one of your uh, you know, great corners that you've got on your team. But Houston's one of those teams where, yeah, you look at them and you go, gosh, they have a lot of great pieces. But unfortunately for them, as we're talking about, they don't have the quarterback. And in today's NFL – you cannot win without a quarterback. Ask you just, the Browns. <laughs> yeah, you, you just you can't. I mean, it's it's difficult to you know when you have all those other great pieces and yeah. you're like, but look how many great pieces. You can't win without the quarterback. So until they figure that out, they're not going anywhere far. I agree. No, I I, I don't feel like there's much of an argument that can be made against that. In all honesty. Uh, one of the last things I want to do with you guys here, stepping away from the NFL as a whole, we like to play games on Bruce Sports, and uh, we played a game this morning on Morning Brew called Who's in Your Brunch Crew. Uh, we invited three people to our brunch. Of course, we're not going to talk about inviting people to brunch right now. <laughs> we're going to talk about going to happy hour right now with people. So you have, okay. we're each going to get three picks. It's more of a draft style, so you can't repeat, obviously. 
Uh, you get to you and three other people, male or female, athlete, commentator, figure, whoever in the sports world, you're going to get oh, drinks with tough. at happy hour with. Okay. okay. So you got to think about that. I'll go first to give you guys a second here. And I'll make my first pick. Okay. Uh, you need a man that can drink with the best of them. Rob Gronkowski is coming to happy hour with me. Of course, it seems like a pretty, pretty like clear number one right overall there. pick, honestly. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it's my game. I can make the rules, I guess. So <laughs> Megan, who's the first male or female joining you at your happy hour party? I'm going to take J.J. Watt to happy hour. Oh, are you? I am. And what are your reasonings for such such a, such a selection? He is just, I just love him. You just I'm need just someone to look really at for honest. a couple hours? No, like, okay, yeah, but <laughs> no, because he's just, like, such a sweetheart, and he just celebrated his, like, teacher's retirement. That's true, his fourth grade teacher. And it was just purely adorable, so I'd like to hear about all of his adorableness. I suppose that's a good, that's a good thing, yeah. I feel like you stumped me with Gronk. Ooh. Now I'm like, I need a bro, you know? Like, you need, I need a bro. <laughs> Everybody needs the bro, I need yeah. Real, I need a party animal. Oh, man. Um, I mean, there's one that's a free agent right now, but I don't know if you want to go that kind of party with him. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to go... You know what? I'm going to go with Chad Johnson. Chad Ocho Ocho Cinco. Cinco. Are you going to pull I mean, him from the Mexican football league yeah, up I mean, to him? He might I'm drink some like him. tequila with yes. him or something yeah. or some margaritas, so that would be right. a fun happy hour. You know he's going to have a good time. He's probably dancing, making a That's fool true. of himself. Yeah, <laughs> okay, there we go. So Chad Johnson, J.J. Watt, I've got uh, Rob Gronkowski for me. Uh, my, my second person that I'm going to take to happy hour uh, I, I want somebody that's uh, that's good at mixing and matching uh, and all types of areas, someone that's a bit of a journeyman. Uh, I think a guy like Al Michaels is going to be a good one because he's mm -hmm. going to give you the stories, he's going to give you the insight, but uh, after reading his book, uh, he's also a rascal, as he likes to call <laughs> himself. So I think like as the night goes on, Al Michaels might be the one you know, telling us to like streak across the parking <laughs> lot or something because he did that back in the day. So Al Michaels is coming with me to my happy hour for my second pick. Sure. Um, I'm going to take Aaron Rodgers to happy hour. Mm. I'm, I'm a true homer. You are. You're taking all the Wisconsin boys here. I know. I know. But, um, you, gotta, you really got to expand your horizons a little <laughs> no, bit, No, listen. I have my third person picked out, and it's going to be a surprise. So. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. What about you, James? Uh, my second person is going to be T.O. He, oh, you're I mean, just oh you're just gosh. Gosh. you're T. turning you up with Jack Johnson and T.O. Happy hour. My goodness. We are having a good time. Wow. Yeah. See, this is, see, when I get to this point now in my draft, I always am like, okay, I've already taken two guys. Do I want to have it be the bros, or am I going to bring, like, a gal that can hang with the bros, or are we picking, like, the pretty girl that we can all kind of semi-flirt with for the, entire t the entirety as well? But th there's a lot of variables that I feel like that last pick goes into. I mean, if I, if I want to stick with the girl that's a bro, Ronda Rousey's got to come with me because yeah. um, she can probably arm wrestle Gronk and win, but she can also hang out. And it's still, you still respect her because she's a lady, of course, as well. So Ronda Rousey's coming with me to happy hour as well. All right. I'm going to take Aaron Andrews to happy hour. Oh, good old yeah. Aaron. I yeah. love Aaron. Okay. I like Aaron. Yeah, I'm kind of sticking with like the safe. I'm not having a super party like James over here. <laughs> so I want to know who his third person is going to be here. Yeah, I'm a, little, whew, I'm a little curious about that. But, <laughs> you know, I like my safe little happy group. I think we'll have a good time. I think so, yeah. yeah. All right, James, well, I mean, who's thinks, the final piece in the chaos? Thinks you, uh, since you both have picked women, I'm going to go with uh, Amanda Nunez. Because ah. just in case I run into your crew. Right. Got to have a throwdown. I mean, just we'll be case. ready. Because <laughs> exactly. you know is going to start a fight. And my so. crew will just be calming down yeah, guys, everybody, guys, breaking guys, up the fight. Come on now. Yeah. Easy does it, guys. Yeah. I like that. That makes yeah. sense. All right. So if you missed it, let us know who you think is in your happy hour crew. We'd love to hear. I've got uh, – who do I have now? I've got Rob Gronkowski. I have Al Michaels, and I have Ronda Rousey coming with me to happy hour. Uh, Megan, who's coming to your crew again? My happy hour involves J.J. Watt, Aaron Rodgers, and Aaron Andrews. Not a bad crew. And James? I'm going Ocho Cinco, T.O. Wow. <laughs> you should have brought Pac-Man Jones. Oh. Man, 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 man. oh. James, a, James doesn't, have, that the, James doesn't have the money for the bail <laughs> yeah, at the end of the night. He'd have been all over the – I don't know about that party. That's <laughs> – he parties a little too hard for me, I think. Plexico. You should have brought Plexico, <laughs> I, too. Yeah, I was thinking that, too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll allow four for that party. <laughs> there you go. I, I can't even. James I mean, I is like, you all four have fun. I'm going to just sit back and right. try not to get arrested, watch. basically. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> well, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I always enjoy when you both come on the show. It's always a good time, for sure. 
Uh, of course, a lot of different things that we were able to cover today talking in the sports world. The Masters, of course, Dustin Johnson. We got to talk to Mitch Vomhoff briefly, one of our correspondents and show hosts about the NBA playoffs. We were talking about Tim Tebow and his minor league and his marriage to Megan. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's so many. I mean, it's true. You, I you, didn't bring him to happy hour, okay? It's not that <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, you're out partying, but you, you got Tim waiting for you at home, though. He's making <laughs> your own drinks, and you're putting on some nice music and like stuff when you get back. I have no comment on okay. that. I can't even go with that. <laughs> Corey says he'd love to chill with Aaron Rodgers at happy hour. Yeah, man, I'm totally game for that. See? Aaron says I'd go to happy hour with Monte Ball. Too soon? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. But, I mean, everybody's happy hour is different, I guess. Whoever floats your boat. Right, exactly. Maybe that's what I should have done. I should have just taken all the New York Giants wide receivers right. that were on the, and go to Miami on the boat. Yes. That would be a good time. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, folks. Thanks for all the comments and the shares as well, too. Remember to find Brew Sports here Monday through Friday uh, with all different kinds of content, the three daily shows and all of our weekly shows as well. You can find the full rundown of everything we do on our website, brewsportsnet.com. You can find us on Facebook. Remember to go and hit that invite friends to like this page and get the notifications as well, too. So as soon as we go live, you can jump on and give us all your thoughts about everything we got taking place in the sports world as well, too. That's James Stewart. That's Megan Landvatter. I'm Baxter Colburn. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow for you right at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern on the morning. Brew with myself and Jamie Evers. And, of course, happy hour. We'll be back again tomorrow at 5, 4 Central time with myself and Grant Coppersmith. Lots of great stuff coming up tomorrow. You're not going to want to miss it. Enjoy your Thursday. Go have a drink for us. We're saying cheers to you. We'll see you next time on Brew Sports.